In this video, we will discuss several limitations to the shear stress formula. First, errors are present for wide flat sections. This is because the stress calculated from the shear formula is an estimate. It is assumed to be constant over the width of the cross-section and varies along the height only. In both these cross-sections here, the shear stress was calculated at the neutral axis using the theory of elasticity, which is an exact analysis. This is the curve distribution that varies along the width of the cross-section. So here, in comparison, we have the shear stress formula here, tau max, which points to the dotted line which shows a constant distribution calculated across the width of the cross-section. Visually, we can see that as the section gets flatter, so going from the top cross-section to the bottom cross-section, the exact stress distribution varies more along the width. And the difference between the exact and approximate solution between the theory of elasticity and the shear formula is much more significant. So this is the error between the two methods. So the error is proportional to the width to depth or B over H ratio, where B is the width of the cross-section and H is the depth of the cross-section. So error proportional to B over H. The top cross-section has a B over H ratio of 0.5. And this actually corresponds to an error of about 3%. Whereas the bottom cross-section has a B over H ratio of 2. And the error here is about 40%. So in summary, as the section becomes flatter, or when the base over height ratio increases, the magnitude of errors actually becomes significant. Second, we need to point out that the shear formula is not very accurate at the web flange junctions. A stress concentration occurs because of the sudden change in cross-sectional geometry. If we remember how we draw our stress distribution, a jump occurs at the web flange interface. Fortunately, we usually design for the average maximum shear stress, tau max, at the neutral axis, and are not too concerned with the stress at the web flange interfaces. In fact, at the neutral axis where we calculate the stress over the web, the web has a very small width to height ratio. So it has a small b over h. And because of what we just discussed, using the shear formula yields a result that's actually very close to the exact stress calculated from the theory of elasticity. Thirdly, there are limitations with cross-sections that have non-rectangular or irregular boundaries. Say we have a cross-section with curved boundaries, as pictured here. The shear formula says that the shear stress distribution along a line across the section, here A to B, should be linear and act uniformly downwards. So that's pictured here. If we take an element from the curved edge, see here in figure C, we know that the longitudinal stress component on the surface, called tau prime, should be equal to zero because it's a free surface. To maintain equilibrium, there is also a tau prime that's pointed normal to the boundary. And that should also be zero because forces must be equal and opposite for equilibrium. So from what we know of vector addition, there should be a stress component tau double prime, which is parallel to the boundary, which adds with tau prime to make a downwards pointing tau. We know that tau prime is zero, so the shear stress must be directed tangent to the boundary in the form of tau double prime. To summarize, the shear formula is not accurate when members have flat cross-sections, at points where cross-section suddenly changes, and when the shear formula is applied across a section that intersects the boundary of a member at a non-right angle. In these cases, we should use advanced methods such as the theory of elasticity. However, in most general cases, the shear formula is sufficient for the design of common structural sections.